Thank you for tuning in to this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Praise God. He is great and greatly to be praised. And thanks to our amazing teams uh, once again this week for bringing all of this to you today where you're at. Right wherever you are in your living rooms, your homes, your car, if you're essential, wherever you're at, you are getting to have church with us today as we lift up the Lord. I know we're the church of Jesus Christ, and wherever we go, we take that with us. However, there is nothing like coming together as the family of God and celebrating and welcome again on this beautiful Sunday morning here at Connections Church. And and we're jumping into a brand new study today, and I'm so glad that you're with us. And you know something that started uh, as early as we can all all remember in our lives is something along along the lines of this. Don't go out of the yard into the street or stay out of this particular room or the house or, or don't color outside the lines. You remember those kind of instructions in your early life and, and it continues into adulthood for a limited time only or How about this, those of you that have tried to buy toilet paper lately, limit one per person, right, per customer. Or you have to limit the amount of chocolate you eat on a daily basis. I really don't like that one at all. So you can't physically meet at the church campus right now. We're restricting groups any larger than 10. Or no trespassing. How many times have we seen a sign like that or one that says, do not enter? What's the point of this? It seems that limitations are all around us in so many different forms in our lives. Limited energy. How many of you are experiencing that right now? The older I get, it seems, the less energy I have in my daily life. Or a limited time, only you can have this particular treat or or buy this particular gadget or, or gizmo or whatever it may be. Limits everywhere we turn seem to be placed on us. And i got to be honest with you. I just get so tired. Of, of limits. How about you? So tired of having things limited in my life. What I want you to know at the beginning of this study, at the outset of this time that we have together, is that we have the opportunity and the availability to live a limitless life in our faith. But the question is, are we even coming close to taking advantage of that? Today, as I mentioned, we're starting a brand new series called Limitless, and this morning, we're going to be talking about our limitless source and supply, and how important is that to all of us? So let me ask this question right now. What does our lives look like compared to the believers in the Bible that we read about? And I know that some of you say, well, Pastor, we aren't supposed to compare ourselves to other people, and how true that is in so many different aspects. However, I also know what God's word says to all of us as the people of God, something along the lines of of that we have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling in us. And also, I know the Bible tells me that God is no respecter of persons. And what he's done for those Bible heroes and people that we read about and study about, he is willing to do for us. He is no respecter of person. He will flow in us and through us as his people still today in the same way in which he did thousands of years ago. So what I want to do for this study, this living limitless study, this limitless look at at, at a series and study is I want us to use as a baseline the account of those early disciples, those first disciples after the resurrection. And really what a good time for that because we are one week out of Easter Sunday right now. We just celebrated Easter Sunday last week. And now We have the opportunity to study what happened next, to see what transpired in the lives of those early Christian followers. And what happened next in those those lives, in those people, is the proof that we can live limitless in and through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Now, if you read through the book of Acts, you're going to see the stark difference in the disciples from before Jesus' death to after he raised from the dead. You're going to see it was a night and day transformation that took place in them. And we want to know how and why that happened. I mean, if you you look through it, you're going to see very clearly that they went from fear, being afraid for their lives, which so many of you seem to be right now in this situation we're in, in our world, to incredibly bold and courageous faith. They went from hiding out Scared for their lives, as I mentioned just a second ago, to publicly preaching the gospel in the middle of the city streets. 
these kinds of changes took place in their lives. So it begs the question, how did this happen? How did they go from very limited, weak allegiance to Christ to living a limitless life in God, not ashamed, not afraid, and not backing down? How does that happen? And the reason we ask that question is because I firmly believe that every one of us who follow Christ, who know Christ, who call him Lord, we want to have that same type of power in our lives. We want to have that same type of transformation and change. We want to have that same limitless faith that causes us to rise up and boldly proclaim Jesus Christ to our world. How does this happen? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to take a look at what I've written down here as the sequence to their success. And it all starts, number one, write these things down if you're taking notes at home, and I hope you are, with a simple word but powerful allegiance called belief. Belief that Jesus is alive and well, and the proof frankly, is indisputable. If you'll listen as I read through Acts chapter 1 in the first eight verses, here's how this account goes. The former account I made, O Theopolis, Luke writes, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after the resurrection, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, listen to this, by many infallible proofs. Forty days, Jesus walked and talked and proved himself to be alive to those folks. Being seen by them for 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but listen to this, church, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, verse 6 says, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times of the season which the Father has put in his own authority. But you, listen to this, because this is where the transformation takes place. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, you would have to sum this passage up by saying that during these 40 days following Jesus' resurrection, that Jesus himself, first of all, convinced his disciples he was alive. Listen, church, no matter what happens, the bottom line is this. We have got to believe. And the resurrection removed their doubts, and it raised belief to life inside of each one of them. And I am thoroughly convinced that so many believers today do not believe completely and fully in Jesus and that he is the Savior and the only way to God the Father. You all, you're almost there, but you're not quite there. You don't quite go all the way. It was William Barclay who said a number of years back, so often we have a kind of vague, wistful longing that the promises of Jesus could be true. The only way really to enter into them, though, is to believe them with the clutching intensity of a drowning man. Man, I love that statement. You've got to either go all in or get out. You've got to either be fully convinced or you're nowhere near belief. And I know some of you say, oh, man, I struggle with that. Just like the disciples said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit will help our unbelief and turn it and resurrect it into full belief. Grab a hold of it like a dying, drowning man and understand in your heart of hearts and in your head that, yes, Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only name by which men can be saved. They were convinced at this point after wavering in their faith up to now. We've got to believe that Jesus is alive, that he's our Savior, he's our Lord, he is our everything. And secondly, in this passage, we see that Jesus comforted his disciples about his resurrection. He comforted them. He told them that they had a future to trust in his plan, that he was going away, but he was going to send the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I know that many of you right now are needing and you're seeking comfort in your lives. You're, you're overwhelmed. You're, you're just kind of scared. You're, you're just kind of doubting and, and not understanding what's going on in these days and times we're living in. But here I am today to tell you this. The same Jesus that comforted those first disciples, he is right there with you right now, wanting to give you that comfort, that assurance. He's wanting to let you know that, hey, you're in the palm of his hand, and nothing of this world can touch you 
outside of his authority. Listen to me right now. The God of comfort will bring that comfort, that peace that passes all understanding, that love, that assurance to your life right now. And why does he do that? Number one, to comfort you. But number two, also that you may comfort others around you. That you may get up like Paul did in the midst of that storm and the ship was being battered that he was on as a prisoner and he stood up because the Lord had comforted him and spoken to him that nobody was going to lose their lives and you can stand up in the midst of a storm like that that's raging around you and tell everybody that will, will hear your voice, hey, guess what? Don't worry. Don't be afraid. God is with us. We are going to make it through this. Jesus brought that comfort to them. He said, don't worry about what this world will throw at you on one other occasion because I have overcome this world. And then thirdly, I believe that Jesus commissioned his disciples to go out and preach the gospel to the entire world boldly, courageously. And man, we're going to talk more about that in the weeks ahead. So I would say that this passage has to do with Jesus comforting, convincing, and commissioning his disciples. And it has to do with Jesus doing all three of those things to you and me right now as well, his disciples right here and right now. And if you're not, today's the day of salvation. Don't wait any longer. He is comforting us, he is convincing us, and he is commissioning us to go out and be witnesses. So the first key to them and us in taking advantage of this is to believe in Jesus Christ, period. Secondly, we've got to do what they also did, and that is simply this, obey when he gave these parting instructions and this promise to them, it was up to them to obey what he said. We know all about that. We get instructions all the time. We get things that, that are told to us that we either follow or we don't. It's our choice. You go back to Acts chapter 1, which we read just a few moments ago, and then this portion says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them. He wasn't suggesting it to them. He wasn't saying, hey, this might be a good thing to do. No, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. And man, that's a hard thing for us to do, I know. We're not very patient people. But Jesus commanded them to stay in Jerusalem, and he also told them to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I'm telling you what today, folks, obedience is everything. 1 Samuel 15, 22 says to us that to obey is better than sacrifice. God wants us to say yes whenever he speaks into our lives. That's all he's asking for. That's exactly what he wants from us is to obey his word. And we're not just talking about good works either that we're created to do ahead of time, the Bible tells us. Because the reality is that good works are not the cause of our salvation. Good works are the evidence of our salvation, but faith in Christ always results in good works. Folks, I'm telling you, obedience to God is the mark of true saving faith. James put it like this in his little book to us, his little letter. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. That's where the rubber meets the road. There's a lot of people out there talking a good game, saying they're going to do this, saying they're going to do that. But the reality of it is those who make a difference in this world, those who change the world are the people that stand up and do what they have said or do what they've been commanded to do. As these original followers discovered, there is something miraculous and transformational about saying yes to God. That is what changes lives. That is what brings a miracle. That is what brings the healing. That is what brings life everlasting, saying yes to God. And I'm telling you something, man, they found that out when they did what he asked them to do, what he commanded them to do, and that was stay in Jerusalem and get together and wait on the promise. That's where the power's at in obedience. Now let me ask this question. What if these disciples had once again not obeyed the commands given by Jesus. Think of everything they would have missed out. And the same thing is true for us. What if we don't obey when God speaks to our lives? What if we don't say yes? What if we don't follow through? What all are we going to miss? What all will we miss by not saying yes to God's word? And Because of their obedience, it placed them in a position to number three, receive the disciples were finally in the right place and the right position to receive the promise of the helper, the Holy Spirit. Man, there is so much to be said about being in the right place at the right time, isn't there? There is nothing like that. I mean, 
destiny changes. History changes when you're in the right place at the right time. You, you think about a company that's just went through the roof with their stocks and, and those who were in the right place at the right time. And early on, they got in and bought some of the stock of that company. Now they're sitting back as millionaires because they were in the right place at the right time. Well, even greater than that is the, the, the situation that these disciples find themselves in. Being in the upper room at the right time when Jesus told them to be there. And because they were there, miracles happened. I want you to, to listen to the results in Acts, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says that now, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, the right time, right? It was the right moment in history. Then it says they were all in one accord in one place, the right place, where Jesus instructed them to be. And suddenly, the Bible says, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Don't you love that? I mean, something is taking place here. And the Bible says it filled the whole house, that upper room, where they were sitting. And then appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of the disciples. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Right place, the upper room where Jesus commanded, right position. Listen to me. They were united together. The Bible talks about they were in one accord, which means they had one heart, one desire, one prayer. And that was, oh God, do whatever you want to do in us. We are here for you and nothing else. We have nothing else on our agendas but to meet with you, to encounter you. Let me ask the church of today, Big C Church, Imagine what could happen if we all got in the right place and we're in the right position, and that is unified together. Listen to me now. Oh, going after the same thing. Jesus exalted. Jesus lifted up. The gospel preached to everyone, and we stop majoring on the minor things that tend to divide us. What could happen? Well, I tell you what would happen. A revolution would, would, would take place. We would experience an explosion of the Holy Spirit's comfort and power and strength and authority and life flowing in us and through us as the people of God together united for him. Just like what happened at Pentecost here in the first part of the book of Acts. Listen to me right now. And please, please do not miss this. Because some of you have missed this for quite a long time. And the time is now for you to get it. Hear what I'm going to say. The person, the power, and the filling of the Holy Spirit is not to be afraid of or confused about as believers in Christ. He is our comfort. He is our helper. He is our teacher. He is our guide. And please understand that he is our unlimited source and supply as God's people. To live limitless can only happen if we are continually fueled and filled by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. For too long, I've heard people say, yeah, and I love God the Father, know all about that, sort of. You know, I'm very familiar with Jesus. I mean, who is it? You know, but the Holy Spirit, I, I don't know. I'm kind of freaked out about the Holy Spirit and all that. Uh, don't be. If God makes it available, we don't have to be afraid. If God says this is yours, let's just grab it up and, and, and sop it up like a biscuit with gravy. Let's don't miss anything that God has for us because I'm telling you, folks, just like it was for these first disciples, this is the key to victorious Christian living for every one of us in the here and now in the world in which we live in. We need the power, the resurrected power of Jesus through the Holy Spirit in and through our lives now more than ever before with all that we're going to face in the days ahead. So why do we run from it? Why are we afraid of it? I'm going to tell you something. I'm daring you. I'm challenging you. I'm charging you right now. Open up your life and invite the power of the Holy Spirit through God to come down and baptize you, anoint you, fill you, overflow you, work in you, change you, transform you. Invite him to right now, wherever you're at, even in the midst of this ministry teaching right now. Open up your heart and say, come Holy Spirit and fill me with everything you have. Don't run from it, run to him. The person and the power of God's Holy Spirit the beautiful thing about the filling of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer is that that term filling means a continual pouring. 
In other words, the source never runs out. Now, those of you that know me well, you know I love my diet sundrop. And because you, you know me well, you know I'm kind of frugal, right? I don't go buy $2.50, 20-ounce ones at the convenience store very often unless it's an emergency situation. But I buy the two liters for a dollar at the grocery store. And I go home and I begin to fill up my cup in the morning. I'll, I'll fill up a cup. And I know it's bad for you. I don't want to get any comments about that. I understand that. But I love the caffeine. I love the burn in the morning, that, that good, good fizz. And, and, and what I found out is I can pour just so many glasses of Sundrop out of that two-liter bottle. And then before you know it, and it seems like it's rather quickly, the bottle's empty. And I'm having to open up another one. But if you can get this picture in their head, the Holy Spirit is the source that never runs dry. He continues to flow and, and fill us up. And, and, and once we, we, we have it spill out of our lives, guess what? He's continuing to flow. If you can picture a pitcher right here and, and me just pouring a bigger pitcher of water in it. And it's filling up, not just to the rim, not just to the very top. But he just continues to fill where it spills over. And it's running outside the sides and off the table and down on the floor. Because the overflow in our lives and through our lives is meant to flow out to other people that the Holy Spirit of God, that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that dwells in us, can go out and touch the lives and resurrect the lives and change the lives of those people around us. It's a source that never runs dry. The fountain that never, never empties. Paul addressed his church in Galatia about something they were drifting on in their belief system and their living out as Christ followers. He had gotten a report that this was going on. And what it was was they were beginning to rely on themselves and not the power and the life-giving flow of the Holy Spirit. Listen, guys. We can't live the life that God has called us to in our own power, in our own strength. We are not a source that is sustainable to keep that life, that resurrection power life, that changing the world life in which we see in these first disciples in and of ourselves. It can't be done. It's not possible. However, listen to what Paul talks about when he addresses this situation and their faulty, wrong thinking and living. In Galatians 3, beginning of verse 1, he says, Oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, man, that's a start, right? Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? There's that word obey again. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having, and here's the part that it gets to the meat of it, having begun in the Spirit, we won't cross the line of salvation on our own. The Holy Spirit does the work of drawing us to Christ, of, of convincing us that He is Lord, and, and, and causing us to, to turn our lives over and surrender to Him. So we start that new birth, that being born again that's talked about, in and through the Holy Spirit of God who does the ultimate work of change in us. So He says... Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? That's the question. Paul understood this, this powerful truth. We can't do it with our own flesh, with our own strength, with our own wisdom, with our own ability. No, ma'am, no, sir, it is not possible. Only through the power of God's Holy Spirit bringing about all of this that we desperately have need of. And I know that's some strong language that Paul uses in this passage, but guess what? Man, he was heartbroken to hear that they were falling back, that they were drifting away. They were going back to relying on themselves. Listen, in and of myself, there is nothing good. I know that. I know me re really well. I grew up with me. I've, I've known me since day one, so to speak, and I know that there's nothing good in and of myself apart from Christ Jesus and the power and the love and the joy and the fruitfulness of the Holy Spirit, that I've got to have him fully alive, flowing, overflowing my life so that I can be all that I'm supposed to be in Christ Jesus. Paul knew that. That's why he, he spoke so strongly. He knew how dangerous and deadly this was. 
Once again, we as believers cannot supply ourselves with all that we need to live limitless lives. Only God, through the Holy Spirit, can do that. The Holy Spirit can and will, but we must allow him to. We must pray again, God, give me everything you have for me in and through the Holy Spirit. Everything that he can bring, I want it. It's like going to the car lot and saying, man, I want this vehicle, and I want every option that's available. Everything that comes with it, just put it on there. I don't want to miss out on anything. If my, if my cup holders can be warmed up to, to keep my coffee cup warm, I want that. If, if they can be chilled to keep my sun drop cold, I want that. Everything that comes on the stinking car, you can put on there, put it on there. Folks, we should be like that with God. Everything that you make available to me, Lord, even the Holy Spirit that I've kind of been intimidated by, afraid of, or confused by, Lord, remove that confusion. Get all that stuff out of my mind and heart. And Lord, I want to be a vessel that can fully receive everything that you have for me through the Holy Spirit of God, that third person of the Trinity. Bring it on, Lord. I need it. I want it, God. I've got to have you. I've got to have him operating fully in my life. God gives the Holy Spirit to Christ's followers. Not a one-time or temporary gift of the Spirit, but an ongoing and indwelling gift of God himself. Jesus promised something very similar in a different place in the Word, found in John chapter 7, beginning in verse 37. And I want to read this passage to you. It says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. But he's coming. And right now, in the, in the passage out of Acts, we're talking about that very same coming that he prophesied right there in John chapter 7. And what he says, I'm going to give you rivers of living water. How many of you like that? Not just a little trickle, not just a few drops. We're not just going to sprinkle it on you. No, there's going to be a river, a mighty flowing river. Some of you have been up to the Niagara. Some of you have seen the great Mississippi, those rivers that flow with such force and such power and just move and carve and create and do whatever they want to do because of the strength that they have. God says the Holy Spirit's going to be even greater than that, but it's going to be like rivers of living water that's going to be flowing in you and through you. That because of the Spirit of God, you are going to be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus through the power of God's Holy Spirit, just like we see with the disciples. The amazing difference in their lives. In other words, we will not be able to use up our supply of the Holy Spirit. Rivers just flowing and flowing and flowing. The more we rely on and need the Holy Spirit, the more God gives us of His Holy Spirit. Listen to me. It's impossible to do better than a never-ending supply of what we need to live for God triumphantly. And I believe that's where so many disciples falter and struggle as the original disciples did before this. Because of self-reliance, when Peter made his bold proclamation, I will never deny you. He was speaking out of the limited power of his own life and abilities. How foolish it is when we've got the Holy Spirit available to us, ready and waiting, and his never-ending supply readily available, and we never, never, never tap into it. If you would just close your eyes for a moment with me. We're going to stop here and pick this up next week. And as you close your eyes, if you're able to, again, if you're driving, please don't do that. I want to ask you this question as I finish my time and we, we worship in song one more time. I want to ask you, are you tired of limits? Maybe you don't know Christ as Lord in your life right now. Your life is very limited if that's the case. I know Pastor Scott prayed for, for you guys earlier in our prayer time that, that those of you that don't know Jesus personally haven't asked him to come and save you. You would do that, but I'm asking you one more time. Maybe you've joined us since then, or maybe you were, you were debating that back and forth. Today is the day of salvation. If you don't have Jesus as Lord of your life, your life is extremely, unbelievably limited. Are you tired of limits? 
Are you tired of running dry and empty? Maybe you've crossed that line of faith and you surrendered your life to Christ, but you haven't tapped in to the glorious power, that resurrecting power, that life-giving power, that life-giving flow of who the Holy Spirit is and is available to you. Whatever the case may be, today is your day. You don't have to live limited any longer. I'm praying for you right now. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your glorious and unbelievable and amazing gifts. This very life we have is, is an amazing gift, God. Too often we take it for granted. We don't thank you enough. We don't live to honor you enough, God. We just assume that it's our entitlement. It's our right. It's not. You gave us this life. You gave us every breath, God, and how grateful I am for mine. And Lord, forgive me for the times that I've squandered and wasted my time and, and not acknowledged you, Lord, and not kept you at the center of my life, God, because this life is an amazing gift. But at the same time, this life is not all there is, God. You have promised and you have purchased life everlasting for us. Through the price that Jesus paid on Calvary's cross, God, we have salvation readily available to us. We just have to accept you, believe that you are Jesus, the Son of the living God, the Savior that came for us, and receive you into our hearts and lives. Surrender our lives to your Lordship. You're our King. You're our God. And right now, I pray for those that are making that declaration, that decision in their own hearts and lives, God, that right now, real, true transformation is taking place. Lord, we honor you. We believe in you. We call upon you for salvation. And God, I pray right now for those people who have been believers, maybe for a, a few months, maybe for a few years, maybe for almost a lifetime. But for whatever reasons, they've kind of shied away from the fullness of the Holy Spirit living in them and operating through them. God, today let that be changed in them. God, today let them get to a place where they're so hungry for all that you have, Lord, that they drop to their knees and they lift their hands to heaven and they cry out, fill me with your spirit, God. Overflow me, baptize me, God. Immerse me, Lord. Change me by the power of the Holy Spirit just as you did. Those disciples gathered in the upper room and I believe, God, that it may not be a wind rushing. It may be. Who knows how you're going to operate in their lives, but I believe fully that as they cry out to you, as we call out to you, God, come and fill us fresh and new. Lord, that you're going to move powerfully and you're going to fill us over and over and over and over again with your spirit, your power. God will prophesy, will pray in the Spirit. Whatever gifts, whatever fruit, we're going to talk about those down the road, but whatever, all the stuff, all the options, every benefit that comes from the fullness of the Spirit and Spirit-filled living God, just pour in, in, into our lives and through our lives. Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers right now. God, I know this is a strange time in our land, but there's no better time for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up in purity and forgive us of our many sins, Lord, and in power. Forgive us for shying away from the fullness of who you are. Let us once again go out and declare boldly and courageously Jesus Christ crucified, raised again on the third day, coming again one day soon and split the eastern sky and take us home to be with you forever. Let us not cower in the corners, Lord, but let us live as the people of God, bold, strong and bright right now and every day that you give us. In Jesus' mighty name and everybody said together, amen. Thank you for tuning in to this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.